if you have a Bible, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. If uh, you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you a Bible. The ushers always have Bibles here for you. Uh, we love studying the Bible and God's Word. And um, hey, I just, I'm encouraged that you're here. You made it. Uh, if, if we gave you a Bible, it's page uh, 906, I believe. Uh, page 906. I would just want to start our time off with this. Uh, it's really encouraging because you made it. Last week was Easter. It was an awesome start. Um, but the beautiful thing about this is it's not just a one-time event. We actually get to walk with you and disciple and follow and study God's word. And so uh, we believe Jesus is alive, that he is good, that he is working in our midst. And it's not just a one-week thing that we celebrate, but every day we get to enjoy God's grace. And so we're happy that you're here to experience God's grace, to learn about God's grace, to study scripture with us. And um, I know I already threw it up on the screen, so you're already preemptively reading it. I could tell. I, could look, I see you guys' eyes. I know if you're with me or not, too. It's okay to throw a little amen to give me some encouragement. I see these beautiful smiles, too, today. Feeling good? It's 1130. It's about to be lunchtime. Hey, the great thing about coming to church every week, great thing about coming to church every week, okay? Um, accountability. Accountability, it's really encouraging. Sometimes we have up weeks. Sometimes we have down weeks. Uh, don't be surprised how the Lord wants to encourage you when you're in a group of people that care about you, that are praying for you, that are loving you. When you faithfully see God, he promises to meet you right where you're at. And some weeks he meets us right where we're at, we're on the mountain, and we're like, yeah, I'm excited for church, let's do this. Maybe that's just me every week. Uh, but other weeks, there are times when you're like, oh, I just, I don't even feel like, oh, I don't know. And there's accountability to that. And it's good to have that accountability. I know sometimes it's hard uh, knowing people, having people know you. Uh, we're a smaller church. This provides accountability. We can, we can celebrate that. It's a good thing. Uh, like this. It's Sunday, Sunday, so we normally usually have an hour and a half of service, but I'm going to tell you up front. We're going to end our service earlier, so that way it could allot some extra time, so you can get to know one another, so you can build relationships, so you can have that accountability in your life. Now that I just said that, I really feel nervous, and I really feel like we have to start now, because I got to end quicker. All right, here we go. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 some of my favorite verses. I just wanted to uh, start off our section with this, and I'll tell you what we're going to be doing today and how we're going to be studying. It says this, all scripture, all, all, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching and for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. All scripture, all scripture. We at Redemption Church, love studying the Bible. We love scripture. You know, you could even go on our website uh, and listen to many books of the Bible that we've already studied through as a church. Uh, you could subscribe to the podcast and get it. If, you, if you're around us close enough, you're in a community group, but they're not necessarily Bible studies, but the word of God is going to be out because we actually believe it's good for our faith and, and profitable and valuable of what God says. He is God after all. He knows all things. He's all wise, all powerful, all loving. And he speaks into our lives. He speaks into himself of who he is. There's a lot of voices out there, but we want to go and align our hearts up with all of scripture, what God has taught us. He wants to correct us, wants to train us in righteousness, wants our walk with him to be complete and us for me to be equipped to do every good work. And so what we do every week is very profitable as we uh, study God's scripture, as we look to his scripture. And next week, um, I'm just here to tell you, we're going to be studying 2 Peter. 2 Peter, okay? Uh, it's actually a letter uh, from a friend of Jesus's when he was alive. Um, he was a disciple of Jesus, Peter, and his life totally changed. And we're going to be starting to, to study through scripture together. Uh, like last week, John 20, Jesus is alive, I took the text and I got those points from the Bible. This is what we do. We believe God's word is our final authority. And so uh, today we're not going to look at a text. We're going to look at a lot of different texts. Remember when it says all scripture? Did you know that all scripture includes a lot of scripture? There are 66 books in this Bible and they all talk about God and who God is. And so rather than going, just jumping into the book of a Bible and the text of 2 Peter, for a lot of us, we don't even know who Peter is. We don't even know his life, his history, what Jesus did in his heart and his, and his work as a disciple. So what I want to do is I want to introduce you to the guy that's about to write and teach us a whole bunch of things. And today we're going to address the issue of who, who is Peter? 
Who is he? What does the Bible say about Peter? What does he say about him? What are some things that we can learn from his, from his teaching and who he is? But when we study scripture, no matter what we do or what text, it doesn't matter if it's Old Testament, New Testament, all scripture, Jesus said in John chapter 5, 39, all scripture, we're talking about all scripture, it's breathed out by God, but all scripture points to Jesus. And so we're not only going to study who Peter is today, we're also going to study who God is, right? Theology, the study of God. What does it look like that there is a real God that interacted with a real person and showing us the character of who God is? If Jesus was gracious to Peter, the Bible says Jesus never changes. So that means he could be gracious to us. And so we're going to look at who Peter is, but we're also going to ask this question, who is God? What does this teach us about God and their interactions? And Romans 15.4, it's not on the screen, but I'll just read it. It says, for whatever was written in former days were written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of Scripture, we might have hope. And so we want to pour hope into your life. We want you to see who God is. He is the God of all hope, the God of all comfort. He's the God of all love. He loves us and is gracious. And so whenever we get together, we, we study Scripture, and we look at Scripture of what it says, what does it mean, and how do we apply it to our lives? And this is something that we teach uh, people in community groups and living life and discipleship of when you study Scripture. Because I don't know if you've ever been like me. I'm a pastor. I've had to study a lot of Scripture. But did you know that there are even times when I go to Scripture and I'm like, what does that even mean? Like, where, where, like I, I've heard this before. People have told me, like, how in the world did you get those points? And I'm like, I just prayed and it was this in the text. And this is what we do. It's called inductive Bible study. This is, this is free. This isn't even like part of the message. I just made a slide for it to just bless you, all right? This is what we do. And you may think, oh, man, he's, he's doing this preaching, and how does he get this point and that point? We induct. We study. We actually interpret and look at Scripture and seek it out and, and apply it to our lives. And inductive Bible study means this, okay? This is what we do. And you're going to see this as a pattern in our church. I'll get up here. I'll read Scripture. I'll pray, ask Jesus to speak to us, and then we'll say, what does it mean? How do we interpret it? And that's where I get my points. And then I'll give some application. So what we do is we read, what does the text say? Don't know what the text says unless you actually read it. So we have to read God's word. We have to understand it. We have to read it, okay? Then to get to the understanding, we have to interpret it. What does it mean? Okay? Scripture says this, what does it mean? But Jesus said something very key when he was teaching. He said, you're blessed not only when you hear God's word, but when you do it. The application, okay? How do I apply it to my life? All scripture is good. It's profitable for correction, for rebuke, for training in righteousness. But when you read scripture and you're a little lost, you should say, okay, let me read it. What does it say? What does this mean? How do I apply it? For example, we'll just go back to this. All scriptures breathed out by God is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. What does it say? It says all scripture is breathed out by, like, it's pretty simple. There's actually verses in the Bible that say how simple the God speaks to people. Sometimes you don't have to overanalyze things. When it says all, it, the Greek word is all, so it means everything. So we go to all the books of the Bible. Yes, the Old Testament. I don't know. I may be the only pastor that I know that has studied uh, recently, like through the book of Nahum with their church, through the minor prophets, through Joshua, through, you know, like we go all scripture. So we, okay, we'll, we'll study all. And then we say, well, what does this mean? Okay, we interpret. So what does this mean? This means that if all scriptures breathe out by God, that did you know that there's a God that wants to speak to people? Think about it. He wrote stuff down so we can actually know. This is showing you the character and the goodness of God, that all scripture is breathed out by God. It actually equips. He wants us and desires for us to know who he is. We have a God that speaks. Genesis 1 says he spoke and the worlds were formed. So what would that mean for our lives? Application. Well, maybe we should read God's word and expect God to speak to us. Inductive Bible study. That thing could preach, I'm just telling you. I know that some of these points that I'm giving you are really good, but I want you to be able to grow in your walk with the Lord and understand that. So we use inductive Bible study. Another thing that um, 
you may help you remember this sort of method or, or this approach is read, reflect, respond. Read, reflect, respond. We, we give out uh, at the resource table start to follow books. Uh, there are many people in this church that are beginning a new relationship with Jesus, and we have people that take you through this book. It says like w- questions like, what is the Bible? What about church, uh, community? What do you do? What's next? I don't know. How do you even start a relationship with Jesus? Like, There's answers to those questions in these books that we give out for free, and we'll actually even match you up with a person to ask, so you can actually ask questions. Uh, and answer questions and those type of things. And they use this, this format and this teaching of read the Bible, reflect on it, or another cute word is meditate. The Bible says we're to meditate on God's word, but read, reflect, and then respond. What do we do about it? Inductive Bible study. And so I'm excited because next week that's what we're going to be doing. And we usually do this book by book. Usually we'll just take a book of what the theme is. And 2 Peter, we're going to be talking about important reminders. It's his second letter, and he's writing this again. There are very important reminders. He's reminding people, and I'm so glad that God gives us reminders, aren't you? I mean, I, 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 I never gets old to me that there is a God that loves me. I never get old of saying, Jesus loves you. I, I mean, I hope that every time you can come into this church that you would be reminded that God loves you, that there is hope, that you can go to Scripture and know God, that the gospel will be preached. These are important reminders that we all need. And sadly, sometimes we all go to off track and go away from these reminders. And so Peter is writing a letter to actual people that are beloved by Jesus, his bride, And so we're going to learn some important reminders through this letter and take about two months to just study it, about a half a chapter. It's only three chapter books, about a a half a chapter, maybe sometimes a quarter of a chapter uh, a week. And we'll just do that approach. And it never gets old because as you do that, God speaks and he ministers and you get to learn about what he desires for your life to equip you to do good works. But more importantly, you you get to understand and know the character of God. And I pray this will be a place where you can know who God is. And so... Today we're going to know who God is by learning some lessons through Peter, the man that wrote this book. And so I'm titling this message, A Case Study of Peter, An Imperfect Leader. A Case Study of Peter, An Imperfect Leader. I'm only repeating this and have it on the screen because I know and you know that only godly people take notes. So if you want to write those down, get your phone out, that's, it's cool. Just want to make sure you remember that when God speaks to you, because we believe he speaks, all scriptures speak. If he speaks to you, you actually may want to write that down, bring a notebook, text your friend, check out on Facebook. You can go say, come on, go preach it, man. That's good. I mean, that's whatever you want to do on your level, it's all good. So I'm going to pray. We're going to get into a few points uh, about Peter, the person of Peter, and look at who Peter is, and then also look, study theology. What does that teach us about God? Does that sound good for you guys? Okay. All right, let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you that we can go to all scripture. And Lord, we're going to look at a lot of scripture today. And we pray, God, that you would equip us to do these good works. Lord, that we would respond to your gospel and your goodness by these good works. By your good work, Lord. The Bible says that we love because you first loved us. And so, Lord, may we experience more of your love today. May we respond to your love. Teach us, God. Thank you that you're a God that speaks that you use imperfect people like Peter, like me, like many of us, God. No one is perfect. We've all fallen short of your glory. And so we are humble servants. We want to come to know you, to learn about you, to grow. And we pray, God, in this moment that you would use an imperfect person like me to speak forth these everlasting, amazing truths. So, God, thank you so much that you work and that you're alive. We pray now, God, as we study your word and as we look at it, Lord, that you would speak to us in a powerful, profound way. Encourage our hearts. May we experience your hope. May we be restored today. May you honor all of us as we've come, whether we've served or uh, as a, a new person, or maybe this is our home church. God, we're coming here right now under your name, Jesus. May you honor and bless those here. Thank you so much for bringing them here another week. And God, may you be glorified. So we ask this in your powerful name, Jesus. And everyone said, amen. 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 All right. 
Listen, today is going to be a little a unique thing. I'm going to have to look at my, my iPad a little bit more because I have a lot of Bible references. Um, you can always get the tape because I know I speak sometimes quickly. I usually put a lot of screens and walk you through verses and things like that. But Peter uh, is one guy that Scripture says a lot about. There are many and multitude of stories about him and understanding him. So I'm going to give you some general ideas and concepts of who he is, what he was like, and what scripture says. And for me to order to do that, I'm going to have to look down to be like, it's Matthew 11, it's Acts, it's John, it's this, this, and this. And it's going to sort of feel today, anyways, like a history lesson. And here's my first point. It is. Peter actually was a real person. Okay, I know that sounds weird and we could jump by that, but I want you to understand this. Peter actually lived just like Jesus actually lived on this earth many years ago. These are documented, written things. It's going to be a history lesson in a sense because it is history. Peter actually lived this world and this life. And so there's a lot of facts that say about him. And this is an actual person, not just made up stories. Some people even think scripture, well, those are just made-up stories, right, to just sort of stir you want. No, these are actually documented things. Um, I like a guy named Charlie Campbell. He uh, has a website called alwaysbeready.com. He's an apologist, and um, he talks about how Bible is historic. He says, archaeologically, archaeologically, can anyone help me out with that word? That's right. (laughs) Can never prove divine inspiration. Archaeology. Hey, I got it. It can never prove divine inspiration. And we are not claiming it can. But archaeology can help establish the fact that the Bible is a historic document. Just because someone, uh, just because archaeology proves something doesn't mean it's inspired by God, but it does prove that it actually was real. And you need to know these things that when you go to God's word and you study history and events and King David and the Israelites and all these different, these actually is history. This is real. This is documented. Scripture is documented. And Peter even tells you in his writing and his teaching, like in Acts 5.32, that he was a witness of real things. And we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit. When John, the Apostle John, will write his first letter in 1 John 1, 3, we looked at John last week in John chapter 20 with the resurrection story, but he wrote another letter to real people, and he wrote this in in John 1, 3, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. That's what we've seen and what we heard, we're going to proclaim now to you. This is in history, this is documented, this is an eyewitness of what actually happened. And so when we study the life of Peter, we want to recognize just simply that Peter's a real person. I know it could just make a drastic difference in how you view the Bible. It's documented. Now, what does this show us about Jesus? Even this, even this is important because a lot of people think God is way out there and he's just letting us do our own thing. But that's not what the Bible teaches. There is a God that is with us, Emmanuel. And if Peter is a real person, this shows us that God works in real people's lives. Like you and I, we're jacked up. Sometimes, like, we can't even pronounce archaeology in front of a group of people. Sometimes you guys make me nervous, man. You need to smile more at me like you're about to attack me or something. Come on, we're on the same team. We're studying and worship Jesus together, you know? Uh, but you know what? A lot, don't, don't you, have you ever talked to people like that? That God is out there, and we're just sort of doing our own thing. And, you know, he doesn't really interact, and he's just sort of, oh, he's the light, he's absent. No, there is a real Peter, real man, and he had real interactions with a real God who really did love him and cared about him. And so we have to understand this. We believe that God really works in history, and he's still working today. He works in our lives. Peter was a real person. Some of you guys may know who Peter was. His name was Simon Peter. Or... Uh, other scripture says that his name also was Cephas, 1 John 1, 4, 42, which means rock. That, that, that when they had a name, it meant something. And Jesus gave him this name, this truth of rock. It said, on this truth, Peter, I'm going to name you this. And I see this about you. And, and, and he spoke. And Peter uh, would be this pillar of the church, an apostle, one that would actually write scripture, that would lead a group of people that followed Jesus. Simon Peter Uh, wasn't always this great, abundant, big leader writing all this scripture, though, okay? 
When we first meet Simon Peter in Scripture, here's what he was, a fisherman. Peter was a fisherman. He was a real person doing real work, sort of like all of you. Okay? I know that sometimes your work doesn't seem very important, but it is real and sometimes messy and sloppy and you want to quit. Okay? Peter was the same idea. He was actually living and working and a fisherman. Those were his credentials. Okay? Simon Peter originally was from Bethsaida, which is actually in John 1, 4, uh, 144. Or you could look at the story of his calling like um, from Mark 129, where he lived in Capernaum. Now, both of these two cities are very small probably six to 800 people at the time, and they're both from uh, the sea. They were city villages. Uh, Bethsidia actually means fishing village, okay? So what do you think this guy from a fishing village would be doing? Being a fisherman. And Luke 5.10 says that he, James, John were all actually partners in a profitable fishing business. In John chapter 1, it talks about sort of Simon Peter's calling of how he first met the Lord, how he first met Jesus. He met Jesus through his brother. It wasn't like Peter was seeking out and doing all this great stuff, and Jesus was like, wow, look at this, look at this guy, this bold speaker, this pillar of the faith. He was ignoring Jesus, doing his own thing. Andrew, his brother, had a relationship because Andrew was even a disciple of John the Baptist. Okay? And after hearing John the Baptist proclaim to everyone that Jesus was the Messiah, that was Lord, Andrew found Jesus, and then Andrew was like, yo, Peter, my bro- you need to come and see this. His- I found the Messiah. I found the Lord. It wasn't until a few chapters later that Peter got his own calling. In Luke chapter 5, verse 1 through 7, uh, Jesus officially called Peter to, the- to follow him, to, to be a-, a partaker in the work of the ministry. And he did this amazing, miraculous story. Because Peter, Peter's a fisherman, and if you're going to believe that Jesus is God, Jesus wanted to prove himself to Peter. So Peter, all night long, was fishing, didn't catch anything. It was horrible. I don't know if you've ever had those days where just nothing goes right. Well, this was like one of those days for Peter. Because he was up all night with a whole bunch of people doing what he was supposed to be doing, catching, trying to make a living, nothing, zero. Okay? Frustration. He's going inside. There's a guy that goes... Hey, cast your line out. Go this side. It's like, really? I've been out here for hours. I'm the expert. I've even probably heard of you, Jesus. I heard it from my brother. You're a preacher, man. Why don't you just keep on going preaching? I'm going to go do my thing. I'm a fisherman. This is what I do. My daddy done did it. His daddy done did it. We live in a town called the Fisherman Village. I know what I'm doing. You don't. I mean, I'm just assuming because that's sort of how I feel sometimes. When the Lord's like, do this. I'm like, really? I just did it. Blah, 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 you know? You know, you guys be doing it too. It's okay. Because Peter was the expert, right? But the Lord was trying to teach him. Jesus was trying to teach him. He was the expert. He knew what was up. And so he so he, so out of frustration, out of obedience, whatever, he just throws the line up. And there were so many fish, he had to get the other boats to pull it up. You can read it yourself in Luke chapter 5. But here's the response that Peter had with Jesus after this. After he saw who God was, who Jesus was, doing this great miraculous thing, Peter said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. He recognized in that moment that he was not the expert, that he was not Lord, that he was imperfect. And there was someone that was greater than him. And this was the start for his journey. It's the start for all of our journey in salvation, that we would submit ourselves to the Lord, that we would recognize that there is someone greater than ourselves, that there is a God and we are not. And so Jesus responded to Simon and said, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And then they had brought their boats to land, and they left everything and followed him. They were successful. They were fishermen. This is what they did. This is is their identity, Peter's identity of who he was, what he was doing. He left everything. I've always wanted to know, like, why? Why do you think all the disciples were so stoked and just, like, left everything? Could a miracle do that to you? Could it do it to me? Well, there is a little bit more to the story as you start learning context in Scripture. Sometimes we go to Scripture with an American view, but this is not an American religion, okay? God is not just for American Christians. He's for people right now in Iraq that are enemies, okay? He's for people of different religious groups. He's a people and a lover of all men. And so we have to go to Middle Eastern time of what this meant. See, if you're a fisherman, this is really what it meant. You're not a good candidate to be a disciple. You're a failure. You're not good enough. 
Now, we may not get that from the text, but if you have to understand that the, the, the context of the Jewish religion of basically Peter had failed Jewish school. Because when you pick a disciple, the disciple really means more like an apprentice. We think of learner. So we think discipleship is all about me preaching, you learning something, and having a great, good, merry way, right? But that's not what discipleship is. When a rabbi picked a disciple, he was saying, I believe that you're going to follow me because you're going to be doing what I do. So it involved some learning, some sitting down, some lecture, but it involved a lot of doing, of walking in the path of following that person. That's why Jesus would say, follow me. You know, I want you to, you're blessed when you do, not just hear. And so sometimes even as Christians, we'd be like, oh, that was a great Bible study. That's awesome. Well, what does it mean if your faith doesn't have works? James says it's dead. And so when we hear the word disciple, we have to understand it's actually more like the word apprentice. That they would get young men and young uh, people to go and follow them and to do what they do. And so what did it take to be a disciple? Well, back then, Jewish kids, they would learn in school the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. By the age of 12, they would have most of those five books memorized, word for word, thought for thought, precept upon precept, and they would be quizzed and judged, and if you got a good GPA in that point, okay, you would actually go on and move on into the, all the Old Testament. There are 39 books of the Old Testament, and you would start learning more, and you'd have to memorize more. From 12, 11, to maybe 16, 17, you would memorize most of the entire Old Testament. You can just see how daunting this was. But only the cream of the crop after those people, those kids, would go on and be tested again by the rabbi to test, okay, now, can I work with this person? Is he humble? I know he knows like 37 books memorized and knows he's where the scripture is at, but what about this? Can he follow this? Can he do this? Can he do this? And they would actually examine him, get the degrees down, and it would be a very significant thing that you would be called to be a disciple of a rabbi. Then after you'd be called a disciple or rabbi, you would follow them and you'd be trained with them and taught with them day after day after day after day for many years until you can do what the rabbi does and then you would become the rabbi for that town. And you can imagine there wasn't that many opportunities for that. At the age of 11, or age from 10, 11, and 12, if you didn't make the cream of the crop, not even like the Old Testament, if you didn't make the cream of the crop, what you would do is you would go and now be an apprentice of what your, palm, your mom or dad did. So if your dad was a fisherman, guess what you would do? You would be a fisherman. Because your dad would know how to teach you that trade and love you and help you that. If your mom was this person doing this, working with leather or fabric or farmer, whatever it is, then you would go and do that. Jesus picked Peter, not in a synagogue, not in the cream of the crop. Jesus picked Peter in his failure of being a fisherman. It's pretty deep stuff, right? This is context. This is why you have to understand and study. And so Jesus picked Peter, and he chose Peter to be a disciple, an apprentice, someone that could follow him. And it wasn't even in a big city. Remember Jerusalem? That was the big city. That was where the cream of the crop. Those were all the, the, the scholars, the students. If you had any hope and dream, go to the big city. It's sort of like, you know, being from Okeechobee or something. You're, 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 if you're going to be in financial industry, you're probably going to look somewhere in Miami, not in like Palm Beach Garden. Well, actually, maybe you are because there's a lot of wealth up there. But you know what I'm saying. It's not going to be the cream of the crop. It's going to be like, oh, okay, you, you didn't even graduate this high school, but I'm going to go look at Harvard. And see, this is awesome because Peter wasn't qualified. He was a fisherman, and neither was James, neither was John, neither was Philip or Andrew. Jesus picked Peter to display his grace. And this is what this teaches us about God. God chooses us based on his grace and not our abilities. God chooses us based on his grace and not our abilities. Peter realized this fact and he left immediately to follow God. It wasn't like he wasn't a successful fisherman. But when you experience God's grace and his goodness, you go after those things and you follow him. And the only way that you receive grace is to receive it. You can't earn it. And so by faith, Peter left and followed after him. And this is why in his first letter, Peter 2.9, it says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his light. It's only God that can save and that chooses and gives you grace. 
And you can't do anything to earn that and be the cream of the crop. And you may have even tried and done all this great stuff, but you've, you've always blown it and never been the most perfect person. You don't need that to receive God's grace. You just need to believe that God's grace is that good. So you don't have to have the own abilities. You could be who you are. And you can receive God's love and his mercy. And that's what Peter did. He was a fisherman, but he received God's love. And this is why the Bible says we boast in God and not our own works. No one could boast of our salvation because God is the one that died on that cross for our sins. He was the one that displayed that love for us, chose us. What a beautiful thing. And because Peter received that, he experienced many miracles. For the next three years, Peter lived as a disciple of the Lord Jesus. Jesus was going around. He was displaying miracles. His first miracle from making, can you imagine, water into wine, raising Lazarus from the dead, healing the sick, and so forth. I mean, these are documented things that Jesus was just going and healing and preaching and, and doing all this crazy stuff. And Peter was right there. He was following him. Peter not only experienced the miracles from Jesus' standpoint, but Jesus empowered him to do miracles himself. See, because he also got to participate in miracles, like being sent out two by two and casting out demons. Or when, they, when Jesus fed the 5,000, it was the disciples that were passing out the bread and organizing, getting groups of 50, getting groups of 100 here. And he was, part, they were, he was participating in the, those miraculous gifts. Peter was a part of the inner circle of Jesus' disciples. There were 12 disciples, but uh, Peter, James, and John seemed to invest, Jesus seemed to invest more in those three guys. Uh, for example, Mark chapter 5, they were the only ones present when Jesus raised uh, the daughter of Jairus. In Luke chapter 17, when Jesus was transfigured in the, in the mountain, um, these guys were there. In Luke 22, Peter and John were given the special task even of preparing the final Passover meal. And Peter, of course, saw Jesus die, and he saw him rise again. Even after Jesus rose again, he saw the Holy Spirit come upon people like tongues of fire. And Peter got to preach to thousands of people and saw 3,000 people at once get saved. In Acts, we still see Peter filled with the Holy Spirit and do many miracles himself. In Acts chapter 3, Peter healed a lame beggar. Hey, money I don't have, but here's what I have. In the name of the Lord Jesus, rise and walk. You've got to experience that and know those things. In Acts chapter 9, we'd see that he'd heal a paralyzed man. He raised Tabitha from the dead. In Acts chapter 5, it describes Peter's ministry and what he was doing as he was following God. Now, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. They even carried out the sick into the streets and the lane. Then on their coats and mats, that is, Peter came by at least his shadow might fall on some of them. Peter would even have in Acts chapter 10 visions and hear specifically from the Lord about what to do and how to do it. He was experiencing miraculous things when he followed after God. And this is the God that we serve, a God of miracles. And this shows us this. When we follow after God, God lets us experience the miraculous when we follow him. You know how I made a big point about this is history, this is fact? A lot of people don't believe in miracles. But the Bible says that we worship a God of miracles. That God literally became man in flesh and dwelt among us. I mean, that's a crazy miracle. Virgin birth. There are many things as you follow God and you experience him, you're going to see things that people can't explain. That God is a God of miracles and he lets us experience miracles. I mean... I was thinking about just all the miracles he's done, the things that are like, you know, God says he's a God of the impossible. Like, we could do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. Like, I've seen to be able to pray for people that have cancer and then been healed. Um, I've seen visions open my eyes and I see something else. Our first church building, I saw that church building when I was in Washington State before I moved here to Florida. I've heard God speak or prompt my spirit Usually it's not a screaming voice, just a gentle hearing of the Lord. I've read the Bible and I've had verses like jump to me and become alive. I, I, I've been able to hear people speak in different languages that they knew nothing of. I, I've been able to see people speak forth things that no one knew anything about me. Miraculous things that happen. And, and I know when I share these things, a lot of people get discouraged and get down because they think, well, well, that's never happened to me. I've never seen a vision. I don't speak in tongues or this or that. 
you have to understand the greatest miracle that God can do is salvation. Even when we read the book of Acts, you realize that some of those chapters, there's a break of years. Okay? Uh, you read scripture, it's like, well, mo, you know, Abraham was waiting for the promise. Next chapter later, 20 years later, Abraham was waiting for the promise. It's not like every day there's a grand miracle, although there sort of is. Because the miracle of salvation is the best miracle of all. Someone can get their body healed, but then they're still going to die. You know, Jesus said, what good is it if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? And so when someone experiences the salvation and the forgiveness of God, and we see this work of the gospel save people's lives, this is why we're as Christians so excited and happy all the time. It's amazing because we experience the miracle of Jesus every day because we found hope and we found grace and we're experiencing his love every day and walking and maturing in that. And this is why Peter says, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That God can make something spiritually that is dead. Us. Sin separates. It causes us to be spiritually dead, found in darkness. But now, because of God's grace and his mercy and his goodness, he makes us spiritually alive. All because we're awesome? Nope. Because God's awesome. And we receive that grace by faith. And the Bible says that we're saved by faith now. When we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, we're saved. Salvation is today. You can experience Jesus today and the miracle of all your sins being forgiven when you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin. Because he's a God of love and he doesn't force, he doesn't push. He gives you a decision. But it's true and it's amazing. And it's miraculous. And as you follow him, you see all this different stuff. And Peter got to experience that, not only in the outside, but in the inside, his own relationship with God. Well, lastly, this. You may think, man, Peter's this awesome, incredible guy. Like this. Like, okay, so God chose him. He was a loser, a fisherman, but he still chose him because he saw the potential. And then he got to do all this amazing stuff. Don't be fooled, though. Peter is one of the people in the Bible that everyone should be encouraged about. Because here's the deal. Peter made many mistakes. Many mistakes. I mean, like, the most mistakes you And the dumbest, stupid things, you're like, really? Really? Could you really do that? Okay? Let me give you some examples. Because although Peter has strengths and God used him in all these different things, there were several failures in his life that the Bible uses to teach us. Remember, these things are written for our teaching and comfort. Sometimes we're comforted because we're like, well, man, Peter did this. So I'm, you know, I blew it too. Okay, great. But also... They're here to teach us so we wouldn't walk in stupidness. We would walk in wisdom as well. And so Matthew chapter 14, it was Peter. We know Peter. I don't know if you know the story. He walked on water. By his faith, he looked at Jesus. Jesus, that's you. Tell me to come out. It's not, you know, Peter and the other disciples. The story is like Peter walked on water because he was the only guy that was stupid enough and crazy enough and had enough faith to be like, God, if that's you, let me walk in the boat. And Jesus was like, come with me. And he walked out of the boat on the water. And then he picked his eyes off of Jesus. He was, he was, listen, when you fix your eyes on Jesus and you have that faith in him and you're walking, you're doing the thing with him, it's incredible life. You'll experience miraculous. But when you fix and glaze your attention on anything other than Jesus, it could be a different religion. You can be caught up in your family system. It could be an idol. Whatever it is, you will fail, okay? And it will go sour for you because Jesus is the king. He's the one that's able to do it. And Peter was like, Okay, all right. And then he got fearful and he started looking around everything else besides Jesus and he fell. Or what about Matthew 16? Did you know Jesus took, or Peter took Jesus aside before the crucifixion and rebuked Jesus? Like, not even like a God man thing. This was like a rabbi and a, and a disciple. And this disciple, this failure, this, he takes his rabbi aside and says, That's never going to happen. Don't you ever speak of that. You're not going to die. And Jesus then rebuked him. In Matthew 17, it was Peter who suggested erecting three tabernacles to honor Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. Jesus came all bright, white, glowing, and then there was Moses and Elijah. Well, maybe we should just worship all three of you. That's when God said, no, this is my beloved son who I'm well pleased. You, should, you need to make sure that he is God. And the other two disappeared. It was Peter who drew his sword 
When Jesus had already said, they're going to come and get me, he drew his sword and cut off a dude's ear. Surely it was a big failure that he missed the guy's head. But then he cut off the ear, there's blood everywhere, and he's just like trying to fight a spiritual battle with the physical. It was Matthew 26 who records us that Peter boasted that he would never forsake the Lord, even if everyone else did. Later on in that chapter, he denied Jesus three times that he even knew him. In Acts chapter 10, you would think after being filled with the Holy Spirit, seeing all these people get saved, that now Peter, right, sinless perfection, he's a Christian now, he's filled with the God's Spirit. He struggled with racial tension and having salvation go to Gentiles and not just Jews. So much so that in Galatians 2, Paul confronts him and, and, and talks about him, about saying even Peter fell into favoritism after learning his lesson. God had to give him a vision of these things. And listen, just because he experienced a mistake didn't mean that God made a mistake. God still chose Peter. God still loved Peter. Jesus knew what he was doing, and he had patience and grace with Peter. See, when Peter sank, you know what happened? He cried out immediately, and Jesus grabbed his hand immediately. When, when Peter rebuked Jesus, Jesus responded and said, But Peter, I, I know you're going to deny me. It's okay. But I'm praying for you because Satan is trying to, to get you. I'm praying for you. When, when Peter cut off the guy's ear with the sword, Jesus picked up the ear, placed it back on the guy's head. It's always a funny, weird story. Like, why would he even do that? He was saying, Peter, you're going to make mistakes. I have your back. I'm here for you. I care about you. You don't have to be perfect. Let's learn. Let's move on. Even after Peter denied Jesus, Jesus went specifically and found Peter to restore him in John chapter 21. You know, Last week, John 20, the story didn't end there. It was 21 where Jesus, after he was resurrected, went to Peter and restored him and encouraged him. Jesus gave his spirit to empower and to equip Peter to do great things. He would even send Paul to correct Peter about these things. And so even though Peter made many mistakes, God still loved him and used him. And why is this important? Because this shows us that God is faithful, that he's merciful, that he's patient with us. But people that blow it, even when we blow it, God is good. And, and 2 Timothy 2.13 says, even when we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. This is just who God is. This is who Peter is. This is what we're looking at, who Peter is. But then we have to understand this is who God is. And God doesn't change. And he's merciful and patient with us. And Peter learned these lessons. At the end of his first book, Chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, he says, The God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Peter never boasted on his own ability because he realized these things. He realized who God was. And we all need to learn God's grace as we follow him because none of us are going to be perfect. And this is why the Bible says we take communion. This is why we end our service with communion, reminding ourselves that God's grace is just that good, that we all need God's grace, that God continually restores and forgives us, even us Christians who blow it, who've seen the miraculous, who's had our souls saved, but yet we still need forgiveness and love. And this is why John would write, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, well, we made him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. The fact is, you can say all you want, but you're imperfect. You're a sinner. You blow it. You're not God. But there is a God, and he does love us, and he loves you, and he died for our sins. And we can go to him, and we can receive his grace. We can't earn his grace, but we have to receive it by faith. And so Jesus tells us when we get together, that we have life in Jesus. To remember that, that the cross, it is finished. Remember that we can go to Jesus, who's God of love. And the Bible says, but he shows his love for us, that while we were still sinners, while we still blew it, Christ died for us. I don't know where you're at, because some weeks we really do have high weeks, and some weeks in this life we really do have low weeks. But our God is a God that loves us no matter where we're at in the spectrum because we all fall short of his glory. And we never arrive to being our own God. But the Bible says whoever received Jesus can become a child of God. 
by faith. And so Travis is going to come on up and we're going to end our service with taking communion. And um, I was just super encouraged. And the reason why I called uh, this a case study of Peter, an imperfect leader, is because, listen, there's a lot of, a lot of um, things that we're supposed to do in honoring leaders and all this different stuff, but this is someone God chose to be an example If you look biblically what an elder, what a pastor, a leader in the church is, um, they're supposed to have characteristics and qualities that people can follow them. This is why Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. This is someone that God chose that we can learn from as a leader of his church. Peter wasn't perfect. But what made him perfect is his confession in Jesus. In Matthew chapter 16, he confessed that Jesus was Lord. Everyone was asking, well, who is Jesus? And some people were saying, well, Jesus is like this great prophet. He's this great teacher. He's he's like Jeremiah. He's like Elijah doing all this wondrous works. And Jesus said, you are the son of God. Sorry, Peter said, you are the son of God to Jesus. And that's what made him great. That's what made him great. That's where we get our greatness in this life. That's where the Bible says we get our righteousness and we get our life and our purpose is not by doing a lot of stuff, but by saying, Jesus, you are the son of God. And when we, when we do that, the Bible says there is salvation and we get to experience God. We don't have to be qualified. We don't have to know everything. We could even blow it. But when we continue to look to Jesus, we'll be able to do incredible, amazing things. And so we're going to do that now. Because Peter shows us that God works in real people's lives. He chooses us based on his grace, not our abilities. That God lets us experience the miraculous when we follow him and that God is faithful, merciful, and patient with us even when we blow it. And so if you're a believer here, when we sing this song, we're going to go to the back. We'll take communion together. You can bring it to your seats. But every week we want to give an opportunity if those people in this room that do not know Jesus the Bible says you could turn to him and receive that grace and it's called salvation and there is hope and salvation and Peter preached this message in Acts 2 he said repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you for your children and for all who are far off everyone whom the Lord Our God calls himself. This is what the Bible says, repent. Turn from your ways to Jesus to accept his grace. And Peter said, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so we like to give opportunity for everyone that does come to church every week an opportunity to do that. And uh, it just so happens that we have a beautiful spot right here. And every week we say, if you want Jesus, don't go to the back for communion. If you've never experienced your forgiveness of sins, come up front so we could pray for you, so we could follow up with you, so we can encourage you. And so we're going to end our service five minutes, but listen, it only takes one step to be saved. All you have to do is believe. You don't have to clean up your act. You don't have to sign up to become a member of a church. You just receive God's grace and we'll help you walk with them. But we can never help you and disciple you if we don't even know what's going on in your heart. So let us know. We don't want to embarrass you. As people are going up front, you come with us. We'll, we're going to start having people here. We'll, they'll come and they'll just pray with you. But we want to make sure that we're growing in God's grace together. And so if you want to become a Christian, as we sing this song, you're going to see a lot of Christians go back and say they need grace. Receive God's grace. Let us know. Stand up. Come to the front. We'll pray with you. And then we'll enjoy fellowship. We'll celebrate. But let us all not turn from God's grace. Let us all not just be hearers, but doers of God's word.